World chess champion Alexander Alyekin had an incredible 1920s. Of course, the decade culminated with him defeating Jose Capablanca in their 1927 World Chess Championship match. This victory shocked chess pundits. Basically, all of them considered Capablanca to be a huge, overwhelming favorite in the match. Now, throughout the 1920s, Alyekin was winning great attacking game after great attacking game. For example, his victories over Bolgoyubov, Reddy, and Grunfeld are some of the greatest attacking games of all time. However, my number one best chess game of the 1920s is a game that he won largely without tactics. Without attacking play, it is his victory over Yates. A game featuring domination of the open file, good knight versus bad bishop, active king, and, in the end, a beautiful mating pattern. I hope you enjoy this masterpiece. Alyekin opens the game here with pawn to d4. Although a great attacking player, he did prefer to build up his attacks with the d4 move in many, many cases. Now we get knight f6, c4, pawn to e6, knight f3, d5. So we've gone into a queen's gambit declined by transposition. Knight c3, bishop e7, bishop g5, castles e3, knight b to d7, rook c1, pawn c6, queen c2. We've talked about this kind of opening theory before. In the queen's gambit declined, white is delaying the very, very natural development of this bishop here on f1 because when the bishop develops, black is often going to capture here on c4 and try to get that bishop to make a second move to recapture the pawn. In some cases, black will capture on c4 early and white can win a tempo. That's why moves like rook c1 and queen c2, which are less natural, less intuitive, come first in these particular cases. Now, black in this position plays a move rook e8, which feels a little bit odd, and Alyekin does have a sophisticated criticism. He says, this move is inferior to 8a6 because after bishop d3 played in the game, black can no longer transpose into the system of defense that still offers him the best chances. Bishop to d3, pawn takes c4, bishop takes c4, knight d5, and at this point, Alyekin makes what seems to be really the only mistake he makes in this game. He plays the move knight to e4, and he himself offers a perfect correction in his notes to the game, saying, the right move here was bishop takes e7. Regarding the inadequacy of knight e4, it should be noticed that in the variation queen to a5 check, etc., the position of the rook at e8 is rather an advantage for black. Now, bishop takes on e7 is theoretical. We're not going to get into that theory, but white does get a nice opening advantage after bishop takes e7 instead of the played move knight to e4. Now, after the move knight e4, Yates actually immediately makes an error in return. What he should do is, as Alyekin suggests, queen to a5 check. Now, this inconvenience urges the king to move, and the best move seems to be king f1 because the problems which exist after king f1 are only magnified if the king goes somewhere like e2 instead. And in this position, a very good move is bishop to f8, although there are other moves that will emphasize the problems of the king's placement. After the bishop pulls back here, white's pieces really don't make a lot of sense, and Yates is looking to play pawn to e5, opening up the position, and it's very, very unclear, and certainly Alyekin wishes he were castled and did not have his king on f1. In the game, though, after knight e4, Yates makes probably the most fatal mistake he makes in the game, pawn to f5. Now, I don't really understand this move. It's a really bad move. The best I can do is say that I think Yates played this move because he was thinking, hey, the trade of bishops here in general is good for me and it will relieve some pressure. And with the move pawn to f5, attacking the piece that is defending that bishop on g5, I'm going to force the exchange of these bishops. So let me achieve that goal. Now he does do that, but in the same kind of moment, he's releasing control over e5, and that is too big of a cost. Alyekin himself says, among the various replies to be considered by black, this is undoubtedly the least worthy of consideration. 
apart from the fact that it in no wise incommodes White's castling, it yields the splendid e5 square to the adverse knight without the slightest compensation. From this point, Black's game may be considered strategically lost, which is not to say that the realization of victory will be an easy matter. Bishop takes on e7, queen takes on e7, knight back to d2, pawn to b5. This might make things a little bit worse, but it's really not that important because the position was so strategically bad that this move only clarifies some things. It doesn't objectively worsen Black's position. Bishop takes on d5. Now, you'd kind of like to do this if you could get away with it and if this pawn were back here, but of course now we can just capture a pawn on c6. So, after bishop takes d5, pawn takes d5, and there is now one open file on the board. And that one open file is fully in white's control. This advantage is massive, and as Alyekin says, it's almost decisive. Also, we have one amazing knight outpost, that's huge, and this bishop is really, really bad. There's nothing good that can be said about black's position, and there are so many beautiful things that can be said about white's position. Now, castles and Alyekin here comments. White's next moves are based upon simple but indisputable logic. By the occupation of the c5 square by one of his knights, he will force its exchange against the opposing knight, after which he will be able to settle his second knight on the same square without fear of molestation. The only comment we can add here is that actually a knight never settles permanently on c5, instead it settles permanently on e5, which is even better probably for various reasons, and it doesn't block the c-file, which al Yekin will own. So after castles, we see pawn to a5 trying to get this bishop into the game, which black is going to kind of do, but there's really nothing for the bishop to do. The bishop will just be kind of breathing at thin air. We get knight b3, pawn to a4, the knight goes into c5, we get the exchange, the queen recaptures. Note that al Yekin, though a great attacker, has no problems trading queens when it's in his, his interest to do so. Here, it just leaves his advantages with the open file and the strong knight outpost on e5, more in relief here. So after queen takes c5, queen takes c5, we get rook takes c5. And in this position and in other positions, a big question is, can black ever try to challenge the open file? And the answer is yes, but it doesn't really solve the problems. For example, let's go immediately bishop a6 here. You bring over the rook, you've doubled on the open file, black challenges, and in this position, you can just play knight to e5, and you can say, all right, you know, make a trade here. Bring the other rook over, make a trade again. Ultimately, I will get a passed c pawn. So I may lose the open file, but I will get a passed c pawn in return, and that's going to be actually increasing my advantage. So actually in this position, we see pawn to b4 trying to create some counterplay over here, but this is just gonna get locked up. You push a pawn to challenge the white pawns and al Yekin is just going to push in return and keep, their, uh, keep the situation with only one open file on the board, one that he controls. Rook to c1, bishop to a6, knight e5, and in this position, al Yekin gives a nice tactical insight. The knight arrives at the right moment to prevent black opposing his rooks on the c file. And now there is the line, rook to c8, rook takes on c8, rook takes on c8, rook takes and bishop takes. And in this position, al Yekin prepared knight c6 with two threats, knight takes b4 and knight to e7 check. And this wins a pawn. al Yekin says this would make the win certain for white. After rook eb8, we see here pawn to f3, a beautiful, beautiful move, already anticipating the coming maneuvers, preparing the decisive advance of the white king. After pawn f3, we see b3 here, and as stated, we're not going to open another file here by capturing, we're just gonna keep things closed, pawn to a3. When you've got symmetry in pawn structure in a case like this with two pawns versus two pawns, you can always keep it closed if you want to. Pawn to h6, and the king advances, king f2, and al Yekin says. The starting point of a mating maneuver based on the following considerations. As black must avoid the exchange of rooks, and as his pieces are kept on the queen side to secure the defense of his pawns, the black king must sooner or later succumb to the combined assault of the four white pieces, including the king. 
Now, it's very interesting that already here, Al Yekin, the great attacker, is thinking about converting his positional advantages into a mating attack. And that's very, very natural, whether you are a positional player or an attacking player, when you accumulate advantages, the natural conversion of those advantages in many cases is an attack on the opponent's king as your opponent is trying to stave off your positional threats. Note here that Al Yekin's not really playing to win material or to create tactics or anything. He's just improving his position. He controls the open file. He has the good knight versus the bad bishop. He has no weaknesses. So he has all the time in the world. In a lot of cases, the player with the advantage doesn't have time on their side because their opponent, given a few tempi, will manage to resolve their uh, their issues and catch up in the position and not be worse. That's not so here. There's no way for Black to do that. So Al Yekin can simply improve his position and make the most out of his pieces, particularly the king, which now is doing nothing, but will soon be doing a lot. King h7, pawn to h4, rook f8, king g3, the king continues up the board. Um, in this position, we can mention g5, which is a move that seemed intuitive to me. Like you want to try and stop the king, especially when you've seen the way that the game continues. You don't want to allow the king to get into f4 as it does. But here, this is just opening the seventh rank. So rook c7 check, king back to g8. You can trade here and bring the rook over to h1 with massive threats. If black tries to challenge the rook on c7, you just come over here and... This is going to win the game very, very quickly. The rooks and the knight are creating a mating net. Stockfish says checkmate in eight. So after king g3, we see rook fb8. This is just shuffling. There's nothing for black to do. Rook to c7, invasion on the seventh rank. He's dominated the c file. Now he will dominate the seventh rank. Bishop b5, rook 1c5, bishop a6. Rook to c6, attacking this right here. So rook e8, defending it. King f4. And in this position, king g8 and h5. Aliakin notes, foreseeing the final maneuver for whose success, it is essential to prevent black's king from emerging at g6 after knight e5 to d7. It's really incredible to me that Aliakin is showing that he already saw the finishing combination here. And basically when he played f3, he was envis envisaging this whole kind of thing. That's amazing to me. This is a position where I can see how to do everything he's doing one move at a time, but to see strings of 10, 15, like 20 moves is just mind blowing. And it speaks to the great skill that Al Yekin possessed. So here, Bishop F1, you don't even need to defend this pawn, but Al Yekin does, pawn to G3, why not? Bishop A6, Rook F7, getting ready to double. King H7, doubling with Rook C to C7, and the incredibly passive rook to g8. Note that black has not lost any material throughout all of this, but black has only become more and more lost despite not losing material. And now the finish that Al Yekin had already foreseen, knight to d7, threatening knight to f6 check with a fork. So you must, e you must move either the rook or the king. If you move the rook, for example, challenging the rook here on c7, then you just have knight f6 check, king h8, and you can take on g7. In this position, black trades one rook, but it doesn't matter because the Arabian mate still exists. The knight is now here. The pawn has been cleared off of g7. Rook h7 mate cannot be stopped. So after knight d7, it's the king that moves instead of the rook in the game, king back to h8, and now knight to f6. Of course, if the knight is captured, g takes f6. There is rook h7, checkmate. Very beautiful. After this great move, knight to f6 right here, black tries the resourceful rook g to f8, anticipated as a defensive try by Al Yekin. The point here is, of course, if you move the rook, then the knight will hang. But that is not going to stop Al Yekin. He takes here on g7, and after rook takes g7, black must capture the knight. Rook takes f6. You don't quite have mate here, because if you check, and the king comes over, the king can go to f8, which is why in this position, the penultimate position, Al Yekin played king to e5, the final move in the game, forcing Yates resignation. Absolutely incredible. Black is up a piece. It is a king move here, and there's nothing for black to do. The rook is under attack, 
and it really has nowhere to go. Black can only defend it with the other rook or retreat it. But both of those moves will mean that the king can no longer access the f8 square. So you will have rook h7 check, king g8, and rook to g7 checkmate. An amazing final position. I hope you enjoy this game as much as I have. I've shown it to so many students over the years. Anytime I need to show open files, anytime I need to show the seventh rank, anytime I need to show king activity, anytime I need to show good knight versus bad bishop, it's incredible that so many ideas are perfectly combined in one game. If you want to see the other nine best games of the 1920s that I selected, simply click on that playlist that is popping up on your screen.